you will turn with me to the book of Genesis, Brother Esmond does best to try to keep up with me. Yes, sir. I've got a lot of scriptures today. So, I'm going to very quickly try to discuss the topic of sin. Um, and I'm going to have to move very fluidly to get through everything that I felt the Holy Ghost give us today. But in Genesis chapter 2, verses 16 through 17, the word of the Lord reads, And the Lord commanded the man, being Adam, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. And so today I'm going to talk to you about the subject of sin. It is an all-compassing subject, so I won't go into great detail, but I am going to get into some detail today. Remember that when God created Adam of the dust of the earth, he breathed into him life, and man became a living soul. And in this beginning, he was made immortal. He, God's intentions were for him to live forever. And yet, uh, then came Eve... God created Eve for him. He saw it wasn't good for him to be alone. He created Eve, and they dwelt together. And then I'm, I'm not going to put all the blame on Eve because Eve made a choice, and then Adam made the same choice. Adam was the one that was given the commandment not to eat of that tree. Eve received the second hand from Adam. And so there was a progression where the serpent came to Eve because she had the word second hand, and she was deceived by the serpent. And she therefore then went to Adam, and Adam did also eat. And by eating, Adam made a choice. He made a choice to sin against God. And so, I want to talk to you about three deaths. A physical death, a spiritual death, and a second death. And when he said, in the day that you're going to eat of this fruit, thou shalt surely die. We go on and read that. Adam lived some 900 years. Did he immediately die? No. But what God was speaking to was these three areas, a physical death, a spiritual death, and a second death. The physical death separates a man's spirit and soul from his body. Breath goes out, they call you dead. You are done. The spiritual death separate man's spirit from God. Okay? And then the second death is found in Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 through 15. The second death is an eternal separation of man from God, whereby God's nature is never again accessible. Can't return from that. But not only did man's spirit die when he disobeyed, and we're speaking of Adam as man, but not only did his spirit die, but his soul, which houses your mind, your will, your emotions, it became darkened, and it became subject to the enemy. Because, in essence, Adam surrendered his dominion over to Lucifer. He gave that to him. He had a choice, and he made it. He relented his authority. He gave up his dominion. And in so doing, uh, he became a child of Satan. So he moved from becoming a child of God into becoming a child of Satan because he surrendered his sonship. He surrendered his sonship from being a son of God to becoming a son of Lucifer. Oh, we got some flashes. And, and so in this process, we find in John 8, chapter 44, John chapter 8, verse 44, Jesus told the self-righteous Pharisees this. He said, Ye are of your father the devil. And the lusts of your father ye will do. And so there's a lot revealed in this one passage of Scripture. That before we're born again, truly, we are sons of Satan. Because of the nature of sin that was birthed in us. And, and you can do a self-test about your daily activities. And that is, uh, is your action or your language even, is it resembling Jesus Christ? Or is it resembling Satan? So you, you could ask your, yourself a question. Who's your dad? Who, who's influencing you today? And if I'm lying and I'm deceiving, 
Am I resembling my father? If I'm resembling my father, who's my father if I'm lying and deceiving? If I'm telling the truth, even when it hurts me, who's my father? If I'm making right decisions in the matter of wrong situations, who's my father? Okay, so you can test your spirit and you can test your own actions in searching yourself daily. Who did I act like today? Who did my actions and my language reflect today? Because that's the one who's influencing you the most. That's the one you're yielding to. So your daddy might be Jesus one day and your daddy may not be Jesus the other day. Put it lightly. So while God's nature is life, Satan's nature is death. And we read in Romans chapter 5, verses 17, 19, and 21. I'm going to just kind of bounce through there. It said, by one man's offense, death reigned. By one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. Sin hath reigned unto death. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 2 says, And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, where in times past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, and the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. And so when he stepped into, when Adam stepped into disobedience, he put all of us into disobedience. And his lineage came after him into disobedience. It became our very nature to be disobedient. Let's talk about the areas that sin affects. Okay, we've talked about the three spirit, the three deaths. Let's talk about three areas that sin affects. Number one, it affects, it affects the spirit. Number two, it affects the soul. And number three, it affects the body. Okay, the spirit. And again, God's plan was to rule man's spirit. And man's spirit was supposed to rule, control his soul and his body. That's God's plan. He would rule the spirit. Your spirit would then rule your soul and your body. But the sin caused Adam to lose contact with his maker. The voice of God came in the cool of the day. Adam, where art thou? We heard your voice and we hid. He didn't hide before, but suddenly sin is making him hide. And so instead of uh, being able to walk in the presence of God, he became partners with the rebel forces, if you will, led by Satan. So Satan's rebellion had now trickled down to man. And so it affects our spirit and that it has disconnected us from our maker. No longer is God over your spirit and your spirit over your body. That's been disconnected. Now your body is ruled by your soul. So let's talk about sin affecting the soul. So now that, again, the spirit is dead, the soul took charge, and man is now controlled by his mind, his will, and his emotions. How many times have we lost our temper and just said stuff and done stuff and broke stuff and kicked the dog clean across the house? The dog ain't done a thing. So our emotions lead us. Our will leads us. I want that, and I don't care what you say. I'm going to get it. Your mind controls you. You have knowledge sometimes that won't allow you to experience faith because your knowledge justifies why you shouldn't respond to faith. Okay, so spiritual concepts are foreign to a man that's controlled by his soul. Adam was a genius. He named every living creature under the sun. And we talked about this before. By the time we got to like 10, 12, I mean, thing with the jigger, thing with the horns, thing with this, thing with that. But he was named them deer, bear, cattle, and cats and dogs. And he named everything under the sun. He was an absolute genius. When God made him, he made him perfect. And now medical science tells us we only use 10% of our brain. 10%. So sin affects our mind. It affects our soul. How does it affect the body? Adam's body was created perfectly. It had endless life. He was created as an immortal. He was created to have dominion over the earth, but sin took all that away from him, and spiritual death caused him to become mortal, which interprets death doomed or Satan ruled. So when he left immortality, he became death doomed, and he became Satan ruled. Having become enslaved by death, he became susceptible to pain, disease, and sickness. Where does your sickness come from? That's where we're going to go. 
Behold, David said, I was shaped in iniquity in Psalm 51 and 5. He said, Behold, I was shaped in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Romans 6 and 23 teaches us, For the wages of sin is death. In other words, your payday when, you're sin, when you sin is death. Your labor of sin is going to reap death. That's what you get paid. I don't know what other kind of benefits come out of that. That temporary enjoyment is going to breed death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans chapter 7, verses 21 through 25 is Paul speaking. And he's, he's, he's explaining the struggle that we have within us, within our body and our spirit. He says this, I find in a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. Mm -hmm. We all know that to be true. For I delight in the, in, in the law of God after the inward man, my spirit wants the law of God. But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind. Now notice he immediately puts the spirit and the mind kind of in the same category. And bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. I skipped the part. Verse 23 says, But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members, my body. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? In other words, it is, it is continuing to degrade, it is continuing to decline. Our body is decaying because of sin. Verse 25, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God. I know to do right. I know when I'm doing something wrong, there's some voice in my head going, you really shouldn't do that. You know what's going to happen if you... The last time you did that, there's a conscience that speaks to us that was cut off in the garden and now God has brought back through His Spirit a conscience, a God consciousness that will speak to us. But he says, but the, with the flesh, I serve the law of sin. In other words, they that are led of the Spirit shall be called the sons of God. When you're led of the Spirit, you obey the law of your mind, the law of God. But if you let your flesh and its emotions and its wills and its desires lead you, then you're going to be led into the law of sin. And Jesus connects sickness and disease with sin. Turn with me to the book of John, chapter 5. This is regarding the story of the pool of Bethesda. And there's an angel that comes through the water, the first one in got healed during a certain season of the year. And so, in this particular case, we begin to read verse 5, and a certain man was there which had an infirmity, a sickness, an illness, 30 and 8 years. For 38 years he was sick. He couldn't get up. He couldn't get into the pool. He was lame. When Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had been now a long time in that case, he saith unto him, Will thou be made whole? And then you jump to verse 8. Jesus saith unto him, Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. And immediately the man was made whole and took up his bed and walked. And on the same day was the Sabbath. So the Pharisees start fighting, what's Jesus doing, healing people on the Sabbath? Ain't that a work? Ain't he, shouldn't he be obeying the law? And so they start in on him. And, and then he turns around, verse 14, and he says this. Afterward, Jesus findeth him in the temple, the same guy, and said unto them, Behold, thou art made whole, sin no more, lest a worse thing come unto thee. So Jesus basically tells us that the sickness, the illness, the infirmity that kept him bound for 38 years on a mat was due to sin. Because he heals him and then he says, now don't sin no more or it'll get worse. So he makes a direct connection between sickness, illness, and sin. So then let's talk about what is sin. While I'm moving along with this clock. There's another great example, but I'm skipping it to get on down the road. So then, what is sin? And the first place we're going to go, of course, is the Ten Commandments. Everybody, for the most part, knows where they are, or knows them, but may not necessarily know where they are. Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 through 26. And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. And then he begins to lay it down. Thou shalt not have no other gods before me. And I'm just going to elaborate a little bit on each commandment. So commandment one, 
There's no other gods before me. That means the God of money, the God of career, the God of wood, idols, stone, idols, whatever it is you worship, put your emotions and your feelings into, your time into, that becomes your God. If you put it before Him, then He's no longer your God, that is. If you, and I've been here, if your career causes you to work seven days a week and you don't have time to pray, you don't have time to uh, worship, you don't have time to uh, read your Bible, you don't have time to go to church, you don't have time to go to Bible study, if you don't make time for those things, but you've got plenty of time seven days a week to work, what have you given your energy, your emotions, and your time to? That is your God. And he said, Thou shalt not have any other gods before me. Number, verse 4 says, Thou shalt not make, this is number 2, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. Now, <clears throat> this is a hairy subject because uh, he goes on to say, Or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the waters under the earth, thou shalt not bow down thyself to them. So don't bow, don't bow down to any other graven images. Nor serve them for the Lord thy God and thy jealous God. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. So much does he detest idol worship that the sins that come from it and the illnesses that come from it, he's going to visit to the third and the fourth generation. And showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. If you keep my commandments, I'm not going to visit iniquity to your children. But if you don't, I'm going to, I'm going to not only come to you with punishment, but I'm coming to your kids too. And it's interesting that he points out graven images, yet the Catholic Church has adopted worshiping idols. What are you talking about? They make idols of saints. They make graven images of Apostle Peter, and graven images of Mary, and graven images. They have all kinds of graven images of what the people do. So The people have come so often and kissed the feet of Peter and, and touched it that they've rubbed the toes off. The statue's been there so long and kissed so many times that literally the toes have rubbed off the statue. Now, what are they doing? They're bowing down. They're kissing the feet. They're worshiping. In fact, the very act of worship means to kiss the face of God. So they are actively engaging in idol worship. They're worshiping a saint that's dead. And they engrave an image of it. And so the Catholic Church and their effort to try to mingle and mend pagan uh, uh, pagan ancestry and Christianity and their effort to bring it all together and make everybody happy, they brought in idols. They've kept these things and God said thou shalt not have any graven images. Okay, verse the, the third one, verse 7. <clears throat> thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. And here I want to stress something because it's kind of one of those things once you receive the understanding it then becomes kind of frustrating. When people say God and then that other word, damn, together, that is not using the name of the Lord in vain because God is not His name. Right. Now, it still makes you do this and it still makes you cringe when somebody's out there cursing something. Okay? But that's not God's name. What is His name? Jesus. Lord Jesus. Jesus. And how often do you hear somebody at work say, oh, sweet baby Jesus. Or Jesus <laughs> H. Christ. Where did H come from? Yeah, Who's that? My wife says she grew up thinking his middle name was Harry or something because uh, <laughs> she heard that used so much in her house that the word H in the middle. But yeah, they are, when you use his name, just throw it out there to swear about something or you're frustrated, you throw that name, that is using his name. Then it was Jehovah, Yahweh, any of the niece, Jehovah Nisse, Jehovah Shalom. All, if they were just to throw that out there the same way we do Jesus, H, Christ, or whatever the people are using, it would be the same offense. That is what he means by using the name of the Lord thy God in vain. The fourth thing, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Now this is where it gets a little interesting because the Sabbath day was part of the ceremonial law, not the moral law. The moral law is what continued. But the Sabbath... The Bible teaches us that the Holy Ghost has become our Sabbath. So you are to remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. It means you are to remember the Holy Ghost and you need to keep your temple holy. Whose temple ye are. Because the, the Sabbath is the Spirit of God. He is Jesus Christ, the Lord of the Sabbath. That Sabbath dwells within you and you are to keep it holy. It's up to you to keep it holy. Remember it's in you. Remember who you carry and with you every day. Keep it holy every day. Now the, now, the Jews and the Christians, 
the Jews celebrated the Sabbath day, which was Saturday. Uh, and then when the Holy Ghost was given, the, the saints would meet together the first day of the week, and they would call it the Lord's Day. And so we're on the Lord's Day worshiping the Lord the first day of the week. We're putting Him first. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all His righteousness and everything shall be added unto you. So that's what we're doing. And that's how we continue to keep the Sabbath. Now in verse 12, we look at the fifth commandment, which is honor thy father and thy mother. That why? That the days of thy life may be long upon the earth. These people would be 90 and 100 and 105. And I remember like George Burns would be 100 something dude smoked cigars his entire life. And you go, how is that even possible? I have to go here and say, well, maybe he kept that. <laughs> But maybe he kept that one. And God honored it and made his life long, even with all the mess. Let it long, let go long. And the word honor means to obey. So if you obey your mother and father, your days are going to be long. Uh, number six. I've got to move on. Number six. Thou shalt not kill. Now, this does not mean the killing in the act of war. It means cold-blooded murder. You kill that an innocent man. And so, thou shalt not kill in cold blood. Uh, number seven, thou shalt not commit adultery. Everybody knows what adultery is. Sleeping with another man's wife or another man's husband. Or, I mean, yeah, you know what I mean. <laughs> Verse eight, or verse 15, number eight, thou shalt not steal. Now, here's what's interesting about thou shalt not steal. We just think, I mean, we don't go break into a bank and take money and commit larceny. But steal means you take something that don't belong to you. I don't care if your children are told you don't go into the refrigerator and you don't touch those cookies because they're moms. And they get hungry for a cookie and don't ask nobody to go sleep in there and sleep one. They have just stolen the cookie. Now you go, well, that's being petty. No, God's word is not petty. It's the same principle that goes all the way up to the larceny to the taking of a cookie. It's the same sin. And it still needs to be repented of just like the other. The difference may be the consequence of spanking versus imprisonment for 25 years. Okay, so thou shalt not steal. Number nine. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Now this one gets very interesting and it includes slander, tail-bearing, leaving a false impression, exaggeration, flattery, failure to defend one who is unjustly criticized. All of that falls under thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. And in verse 10, I'm sorry, verse 17, number 10 of the commandments, thou shalt not covet, and you can stop there, thou shalt not covet, but he goes on to say what coveting means. Thou shalt not cover thy neighbor's house, thou shalt not cover thy neighbor's wife, thou shalt not uh, cover, uh, covet his manservant or his maidservant or his ox or his ass or anything that is thy neighbor's. In other words, it's not a problem to desire a house or desire an ox, desire to have one, but it's when you want your neighbors. Right. I want a house like theirs. In fact, I don't just want a house like theirs. I want theirs. <laughs> and, and, and so this is what coveting, wanting something somebody else has. You don't have it. You want what they have. That's coveting. And all the people saw the thunderings and the lightnings and the noise of the trumpet and the mountain was smoking, and when people saw it, they removed and stood afar off. And they said to Moses, Speak thou with us, and we will hear. But let not God speak to us, lest we die. Because he was thundering out those things. He was speaking those things. And it was like... <laughs> that's, that's what they were up to. No, just send us Moses. You're scaring us, God. Verse 20. And Moses said unto the people, Fear not, for God has come to prove you, and that his fear may be before your faces, that ye sin not. I just told you what I don't like and what I don't want you to do. Don't do these things. Lest. The word sin literally is the word called tall, and it means to miss the mark. To miss the mark. Uh, it means uh, to forfeit, to lead astray, to trespass. And so God has set a mark that says, if you're going to serve me and if you love me, you won't do this, 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 and this. So if you do this, 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 and this, then you have missed the mark that I have set for you. 
You've missed my goal for you. That's what sin is. The iniquity of the fathers being visited upon the children. When I was going over that in verse 4 and 5. Uh, this word iniquity is avon, avon, which means perversity, moral evil. And the punishment of that is what went on from generation to generation. Not only that, but the sins would drift into generation to generation. If one began to have a problem and it went unrepentant, it would get into the bloodline and go from one generation to the next generation. Even today, if you look through your family, and you look back up to your mom, your dad, your grandparents, is there something all the way down our family that we have always struggled with. Whether it be alcohol following down generation to generation, or it be uh, gambling going from one generation to another generation, or maybe it is uh, fornication or lasciviousness, someone who can never stay committed to one woman or one man. It, is it running through the line? Is your grandma, your aunt, is it all the way up the line? If it is, then you have a generational sin that started with one man and it was carried from generation to Generation until one of the generations stands up and repents for the sins of their fathers. Scripture teaches us we can repent not only for ourselves, but we can repent for our bloodline. I'm not guilty of it, but my grandpa, my great grandpa, and my great great grandpa was. Lord, forgive me for what they did. And you call forth. The name of Jesus, you call for it the blood, and you take it down a watery tank, and God washes your whole family line. Boom, it's gone. Sometimes, even after you have been baptized, you've been filled with the Holy Ghost, things start showing up. You're not necessarily guilty of it, but you start seeing a trace in your family. You look at your kids, and they start acting like people in your family, and you and you recognize, oh, they haven't been baptized yet, they haven't been filled with the Holy Ghost yet, they haven't repented yet, and it is affecting them. So it's my job. To nip this thing in the bud. I'm cutting off this curse. We're going to repent together. I'm going to kill this curse right here, and you're going to begin anew. So this thing ain't coming to my kids. I had some in my family. I, I, it ain't going to my kids. When I first saw Papa, go, oh, we're dealing with this right now. You're not going to suffer the stuff I suffer. You're not going to deal with the stuff I have to deal with. And so this is what happens. And the word uh, iniquity comes from a, a, another word, <clears throat> of all, uh, which is to crook do amiss, to bow down, to make crooked, to pervert, to do wickedly, or to do wrong. And so basically the iniquity is, is doing the exact opposite or a twisting of what God desires. It's, it's, it, it would almost sort of resemble what He wants, but not quite. Or it could be the very opposite of what God desires. Let's look at the first time the sin's mentioned in your Bible. Genesis chapter 4 verse 7. If thou doest well, thou shalt not, or shalt thou not be accepted. If you do well, won't you be accepted? Won't everything be well? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And that word lieth means to crouch like a tiger. If you're not doing well, sin's like a tiger just ready to pounce on you. It's going to jump in and do what? Wreak havoc to your soul, your body, and your spirit. It's waiting. You mess up, I'm all over you like white all right. Sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall his desire, shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. So sin will rule over you, crouching like a tiger, jumping and pouncing on you when you give into it. I have got to move very quickly. Abominations. We're going to run through these because they're bad stuff. Proverbs 6, chapter 16 through 19. These six things that the Lord hate, yea, seven, are an abomination. And I, let me define abomination. These, things, these, these seven things are an abomination to Him. But the word abomination is defined this way. Loathe, detest, disgusting, cause to vomit. So these things are so sinful that it causes God to want to vomit. And the scripture teaches that once it is an abomination to Him, it is always an abomination. That doesn't change. It's always awful. And if you begin to read down through these, he says a proud look, which uh, would go to meaning the attitude that makes one overestimate oneself and discount others. And you ain't driving a car like me. Your hair ain't as nice as mine is. I'm curly, you straight. You, you, you don't measure up. That arrogance, that looking down, that condescending, that proud look. A lying tongue, untruths, deceptions. 
Hands that shed innocent blood, a murderer, killer. Uh, and heart that devises wicked imagination. In other words, a heart that's always planning wickedness. He don't just do a wicked thing in a moment. He's planning it out. I'm going to do something wicked. I'm going to steal. I'm going to kill. I'm going to do this. And this is how I'm going to do it. Feet that be swift and running to mischief. Or uh, someone who's in a hurry to go run. To, they see some people. Hey, can I help? Can I get involved in this? Go rob a bank? Let me help. I'll drive the car. A false witness that speaketh lies, which means a deceiver that breathes out lies, constantly lying and deceiving. He that soweth discord. Why do you think God hates that? Because he's truth. Reminds him of his adversary, or our adversary. He that soweth discord among the brethren. Rumors. So even in the church, when, when someone's circulating rumors and gossip, God said, I hate that. It makes me vomit. And then we move on to Leviticus chapter 20 and 13. It says, If a man also lie with mankind as he laughs with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They should utterly be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. Deuteronomy 8, 10 through 12. There shall, be, there shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or his daughter pass through the fire. In other words, not sacrificing their kids to these gods and fire, and they would have these little firewalls, and if they survive, oh, they're gods almost, but most of them die. Or that uses divination, or an observer of times. So if you like the horoscope, you might want to put that away. God called that an abomination. Or an enchanter, or a witch. There ain't no such thing as a good witch, a white witch, or heaven forbid, a heavenly witch. Or a charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard. No such thing as a good wizard. Or a necromancer. And I don't have time to really break down what all those are. We'll have to do that next time. Verse 12. For all that do these things are an abomination. Not only are those things abomination, but he said the people that do them are an abomination to me. You disgust me. That's what God says when you're involved in that. You disgust me. Not the sin you do. Now, there's sins that disgust him, but there are people that are involved in certain sin. Because they're involved in those types of things, they disgust God. Oh, but God loves everybody. He might love you, but He don't want to leave you the same way He found you. And there's still things you do, even in His love for you, that disgust Him. And then he says this, and these are abominations of the Lord, and because of these abominations of the Lord, like God drove them out from before you. He ran them. I, I brought you to a land, and because I hate these things, I pushed them out before you got here. And when you get here, if you see any of that stuff, you push it out. So in your house, on your tube, whether it be a, a computer tube, or a TV tube, or a phone tube, push these things out because they are abominations to God. If you love the walking dead, time to put it up. If you like Grim Brothers, time to get rid of that. If you like witches and warlocks and all that jazz, God said that disgusts me. If you want a relationship with God, that has to go. It has to go. And then we get to Luke chapter 16, verse 11 through 15. If Brother Keith would come and help me on the keyboard. Try to wrap this up as best I can. If therefore ye have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, the word mammon meaning wealth, money obtained deceitfully, who will commit to you your trust to true riches? And if ye not, if ye have not been faithful in that which is another man's, who shall give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and men. In other words, you can't serve God in material possessions. You can't have both. You've got to find a fine line there. I, I know exactly what I need to make to take care of my family and still serve God. If that means I need to let go of some wants or desires so that I can take care of them and live for God, then that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to learn to live right here. Oh, I can pursue those things, but I'd rather pursue a relationship with God and take care of my responsibilities and not let one over reach the other. And the Pharisees also who were covetous heard all these things and they derided him. And he said unto them, Ye are they which justify yourselves before men. But God knoweth your heart. For that which is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. 
And so in other words, all these commandments, all these abominations where they were literal and physical and you would you could be stoned to death for disobeying in the New Testament, all you have to do is repent and He will forgive you of those things. But here's the deal, it's a little worse. He doesn't wait until you commit it that it's a sin. It's when it gets in your heart that it becomes a sin. Whether you ever commit it or not. Because if, it, if it's in your heart, eventually you will do it. And He's telling you, as soon as it gets in your heart, I see your heart, it's time to clean it up. Matthew 5, 27 through 28. Ye have heard that it was said by the, them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery, but I send you that whosoever look upon a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. He needs to repent before he does the act. Because if he keeps doing it in his heart, it's going to happen. Your sins are literally killing you, body, soul, and spirit. They're here to destroy you. That is the goal. But John 1 and 9 says this. If we confess our sins, if we utter the Lord, I have been guilty of lying. Forgive me. We confess our sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So the bad news is there's sin out there. The bad news is our flesh wants to. The good news is you can resist it if you submit yourself to God. Resist the devil, he will flee from you. If you submit yourself to God, you confess with your mouth, Lord. I've had dreams where there was an adultery thing in my dream. I've had dreams where there was some fornication thing in my dreams. And I, I woke up going, oh, that's unclean. God, forgive me. Because if it's in my dream, somewhere it's in my subconscious. If it's a spirit trying to mess with me, Lord, forgive me right now. Of adultery. I'll say, it. I hadn't done it, but in my dream I did. Lord, forgive me for adultery. I murdered somebody. I fought somebody. I killed somebody. Lord, forgive me of murder. You've got to make sure you're clean before God. Let's stay together. i got to make sure that I am clean before We've got a few minutes before the others are going to come in. We've got about three minutes. And what I want us to do right now is I want us to pray. I want to take this time to do some confessing, to do some searching. You, you've heard what sin is. You've heard what sin does. You probably realize you got stuff in your life. Okay, it came from sin. You realize it now. That's what, that's what the Word does. It reveals and identifies stuff so we can overcome it. So I want us to pray right now. Let's just go to prayer and ask God to search us. Let's do some repenting. Father, we come before you right now in the name of the Lord Jesus. Father, search my spirit. Search our hearts, oh God. Bring the sin to our mind, God, that we need to repent of. Forgive Father, forgive me, Lord, for the times that I've lied on a job to keep the job. Forgive me for the times I've lied on a resume to get the job. Father, that's not you. Forgive me, Lord, for doing the acts of Satan. Forgive me, Lord, for doing the acts of the accuser of the brother. Forgive me for the sin that has been in my life. And give me power and strength to overcome it. In the name of Lord Jesus. Jesus, forgive me, Lord, for letting my temper get the best of me. Forgive me for being angry and sinning. Forgive me, Lord. God. Forgive me, Lord, for thoughts of fornication, thoughts of adultery, acts of fornication. Lord, forgive me, Lord. Wash me, cleanse my mind, cleanse my spirit, cleanse my soul, cleanse my body, Lord, and cleanse me, O God. While you're praying, forgiving, you need to understand something. The scripture says in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. The word remission doesn't just mean wash away away, it means forgiveness. You are not truly forgiven. You repent, you come before God, you turn around. But you're not truly forgiven until you go down in a watery grave and have the name of Jesus called over you. You have to do that for the forgiveness of your sins. So we need to repent right now, but you need to also know that I need to be baptized. Some of us have been baptized before. We've entered into stuff, and, and we've defiled our bodies and our minds and our spirits, and we probably, it would be good for us to be rebaptized. We need to consider that this morning. Father, maybe I need to be rebaptized, but Lord, right now, come on, let's keep repenting, search your heart. With your mouth, make confession. Forgive me, Jesus. Forgive me, Jesus. Oh, in the name of the Lord Jesus, forgive me, Father.